Hello, beloved friends. These are historical lessons with Tamara Eidelman. Today we will discuss Tsarevich Alexei, the son of Peter I, a significant figure in Russian history, whom we frequently remember, regarding the Tsarevich who was either killed by his father's order or died from torture. The exact circumstances remain unknown to us. We definitely wouldn't have been able to record this show if we didn't have the support of our patrons, the individuals who have subscribed to donations on the Patreon platform. Thanks a lot. And anyone else who wants to become our patrons has the opportunity to do so if they wish. You simply need to follow the link and make a donation. Thank you. In 1682, 10-year-old Peter Alexievich, the son of Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, formally became the Tsar. We have already talked about it in our lecture dedicated to Princess Sophia, but let's remember a little bit. Alexei Mikhailovich has many children, the first wife of Maria Miloslavskaya, and several years after his death, his eldest son Fyodor ruled. In the year 1682, Fyodor passes away. In theory, his biological brother Ivan, who is 16 years old, was expected to inherit. Ivan is slow, strange. Another group of relatives, consisting of the second wife of Alexei Mikhailovich Narishkin and her family, stands behind Peter, and the Narishkins are making efforts to choose a strong, smart, lively boy Peter as the future Tsar of Russia. This leads to the Streltsy uprising, to the beginning of the Miloslavsky and Narishkin struggle. And the Miloslavskys emerge victorious. It was determined that both boys, Ivan and Peter, will assume the role of kings. And it will be until Ivan's death in the year 1995. And for now, their sister, Princess Sophia, will be the ruler together with them. Angry Natalia Kirilovna, mother of Peter, takes her son and leaves with him to Preobrazhenskoya the suburban village, and they practically do not appear in Moscow. Until 1689, actual power will be in the hands of Sofia. In 1889, Peter was already 17 years old. This is more than now, of course. At that moment, he was already practically an adult. And Natalia Kirilovna understands very clearly that she needs to show what an adult her son is. Another sign of adulthood is needed for this. She finds him a decent wife, as we would say today, of noble birth, the daughter of Boyar Evdokia Lopukina. Well, there is no talk about love, but in fact, what parents at that moment married their children for love. This, of course, applied not only to the royal family. Parents decide whom to marry and give away in marriage. Patience love, it was generally common. Another issue is that Peter, of course, was not very ordinary. Well, who knew that? So, in 1689, 17-year-old Peter marries Evdokia Lopukina. This once again emphasizes his maturity, his readiness for adult life, highlighting his preparedness for the challenges of being an adult. A new conflict arises with Sophia, but as a result, in 1689, Sophia is deprived of power, sent to a monastery, and Peter becomes the Tsar. Not in words, but in deeds. A year later, they have a son, little Tsarevich Alexei. Another boy will be born in a year, but the second boy lived a very short time. Therefore, Alexei turned out to be the only one. He is the son of Peter and Evdokia Lopukina. Unfortunately, family life didn't work out right away. It is believed that Evdokia did not understand what Peter wanted. I'm not sure he expected his wife to understand him that much. However, he did not love, did not like, it was unpleasant, apparently even. Then come the turbulent years of the beginning of Peter's reign, when he is only considering future reforms, thinking about what to do and how, dreaming of the sea, starting to build ships, going on the first Azov campaign, besieging the fortress of Azov, which belonged to the Crimean Khanate. In the second Azov campaign, Azov takes it further, deciding, well, it seems like in order to find allies, to develop success under Azov, to move towards the Black Sea, to fight the Ottoman Empire, you need to find an ally in Europe. 
Here he is heading to the great embassy under a light cover, reportedly as the bombardier Peter Mikhailov, though it's evident to all that he is the Tsar. And then there is his renowned journey through Europe, where he learns to construct ships in Holland, where he travels to England, and where a multitude of other fascinating things happen along the way. The wife, of course, remains at home throughout this entire period, and at this particular moment, he is already attempting to discover a means to eliminate her. Negotiations have commenced with her to join a monastery. We frequently utilize the phrase to shave the head, forcibly shave the head of a monk, of a nun. In fact, it was previously impossible to do this without the permission of the individual who is being shaved. Another matter is that there are many different examples in Russian history when this was bypassed. And in 1698, the unfortunate Evdokia Lopukina is tonsured as a nun, allegedly with her consent, and sent to the Suzdal Pokrovsky Monastery, where two centuries before her, Solomonia Soborova, the first wife of Vasily III, was sent. Evdoki is sent to the monastery, the son stays, Naturally, one would like to say with the father, but in fact not quite with the father because the father hardly sees him, but the son stays in Moscow. He is raised in the right principles according to Peter's perspective. He is educated in foreign languages. He is educated in the sciences that will be necessary for fortification, for commanding the troops and so on and so forth and the like. Evdokia Lopukina heads to the monastery, though, she reaches there quite swiftly. Although she lives in a monastery, she stops behaving like a nun. With her, of course, they really respect her there. Everyone understands that she is the queen. Today she's an exiled wife. Tomorrow her son will be king and she'll be the mother of the king. She is cared for, and when she starts walking in secular clothes, she begins living like a secular woman, just ending up in a monastery, and then starts a romance with Major Stepan Glebov. Well, in general, no one bothers her. She is covered in every way. For a while, Peter ignores this and appears unaware of it. However, he is unconcerned about that. He has crucial things happening. The war with Sweden starts in 1700 and will endure for 21 years. Initially there are failures and then he begins to make changes to the army. He establishes record sets to recruit people from all over the country to join this army. Additionally, he establishes factories to manufacture cannons for the new army. Furthermore, he invites officers from foreign countries and sends Russian nobles to study abroad. Well, in general, the Petrovsky reforms are beginning. All these numerous diverse reforms of his, about which it is impossible to tell everyone here. I am close and understand the concept of the historian Vasily Kluchevsky, who reasonably said that, in general, Peter did not have a well-thought-out reform plan. He first of all wanted to defeat Sweden, wanted to reach the Baltic Sea, to get the coast of the Baltic Sea, well, to break a window into Europe, as the classic wrote. And then he did what was required for this purpose. Here it was necessary to maintain a brand new army. He sets record collections. It was necessary to assign shelves to provinces which he divided the country into. He establishes novel government entities. Well, concurrently, he introduces a fresh calendar, new clothing, an innovative alphabet, and additional holidays to the society. And everything is so new. And during these years, a little boy named Alexei is growing up. We don't know what he thinks about his mother. He knows where his mother is, because in a few years, when he will be quite grown up, when Charles XII was going to Moscow, but did not reach it, and turned towards Poltava, then Peter entrusted his son, who was already 19 years old, to deal with the fortifications of Moscow. And he did his best. In general, Alexei had a strong desire to please his father. He put all his efforts into it. Father was dissatisfied, not because he did it badly, but perhaps the main reason was that he was informed that the prince secretly traveled from Moscow to Suzdal to see his mother. This caused Peter to be extremely angry. All these years, the boy, then the young man, was not allowed to see his mother. 
However, we can envision the intense emotions that were simmering in his soul. Regrettably, our understanding of Alexei as an individual is not very comprehensive. We know the stunning image of him created by the great Nikolai Cherkasov in the film Peter the Great, where he is, to put it bluntly, repulsive. And this means the embodiment of all reactionary forces. We have knowledge of the image of General Peter Alexeyevich interrogating the successor of Alexei Petrovich, in which a pale, gloomy, unattractive, skinny individual is standing, and we wonder what lies within his soul. Alexei was a person who held strong religious beliefs. In any case, what already annoyed Peter, who saw in the church an opponent of his changes, which, in general, was largely true and accurate. The patriarch disliked young Peter's actions, so when he died in 1700, Peter prevented the election of a successor. And in 21 years, the Russian church will be without a patriarch, there will be a caretaker performing duties, and in 21 years, the church will be subordinated to the state apparatus. A new state body, the Holy Synod, will be created, who control church affairs. Peter created, and he liked it terribly, and for many years he entertained himself, collecting his completely blasphemous, all-joking, all-drunken cathedral, where, on the one hand, it is just such a gathering of Peter's friends who indulged in absolutely unrestrained drunkenness and indecent various entertainments, but all these entertainments had such an anti-church character. It is precisely this that made fun of the service, the shrines, and other similar things. This did not contradict at all what Peter pursued in relation to the old believers. That is another matter entirely. Naturally, any individual who deviated from faith was penalized, but this is the condition, this is the religion of the state. And the church, as an independent organization, which may not appreciate his disregard for traditions, is perceived as the enemy that opposes his actions and beliefs. And Prince Alexei was very religious. He spent a lot of time with priests and monks since his youth. And this was one of the things that bothered Peter. Gradually, he starts to see in him such an opponent of reforms. Although, again, I'm not sure that this is true. Alexei was raised in these reforms. He matured in the midst of this new world. He became accustomed to it. It's clear that he truly disliked how his father treated his mother. It is clear that he suffered greatly from such harsh neglect with which his father treated him. But this is a completely different idea. Certainly it appears that there were individuals who observed Alexei and believed that upon his accession to the throne, the previous way of life would not be restored. Probably it was already clear quickly. But in any case, the power will become softer. Peter, who clenched everyone from the last peasant to the aristocrats in his fist, and everyone had to serve the state, and everyone had to go to war, and carry the burden of building St. Petersburg with their bones, and universal subordination, it was such a heavy pressure on the whole country. Perhaps there were people who thought that in the future the young Tsar would rule more leniently. However, I would not exaggerate this environment, supposedly so terrible, anti-Petrovskaya around Alexei. Peter himself believed that Alexei was surrounded by his enemies. Or he found it convenient to think so because his son was annoying him. But obviously, we will never know that. However, regardless of that, Alexei remains the sole heir for an extended period. There are no other heirs. In 711, he married a relative of the Austrian emperor, Charlotte Wolfenbüttel. And soon they have a daughter and then a son named Peter in honor of his grandfather. And so the line of this male inheritance is continued. It would seem that everything is fine. But Peter obviously at this time is extremely hurt by the thought that this unloved son is causing him so much pain. And Peter, he was certainly a man of strong passions. He loved who he loved, already forgave everything or forgave a lot. Alexashka Menashikova could be beaten, but he loved. And he forgave him for things that would have sent others to hard labor at least. Tsarevich Alexei did not like. Here stood his disliked wife behind him, a presence that he found unpleasant and irksome. But what to do? 
Meanwhile, in 1702, at the start of the Northern War, Russian troops in Livonia capture a beautiful young maid, a servant, a portomoy, as they will later say, Marta Skavronskaya, among the prisoners. Marshal Sheremetev, an elderly gentleman, fixed his gaze upon her and took her as his mistress. Then Menshikov observed her, who without any hesitation took away the young woman Sheremetyeva from the scene. Sheremetyev didn't object to the Tsar's favorite, despite their worsening relationship. Soon Marta Skavronska saw Peter and took him. And in this way she becomes Peter's beloved. She accepts orthodoxy and she transforms into Catherine Alexeevna. And she has been residing with Peter for numerous years. She gives birth to him offspring. This is his beloved, one of many, by the way. However, Catherine, of course, had a very significant influence on Peter. She naturally understood nothing about state administration, not then or later, when she becomes empress after her husband's death. All this was completely beyond her reach, but she knew how to soothe him. Everyone knew this. When Peter had his completely uncontrollable fits of rage, when his cheek started twitching, this tick that he had since childhood after the Streltsy uprising, when he and his brother were taken out onto the porch in front of the raging crowd of Streltsy, whom the boyars threw to be torn apart, and when he commenced to rage, his cheek twitched, he possessed the capability to do anything at all, then the courtiers pursued Catherine, and she approached and calmed Peter down. He rested his head on her lap, closed his eyes, and woke up. She wasn't angry. You couldn't ask. She could stand up for someone. By the way, she was an incredibly courageous woman, undoubtedly. She demonstrated this in the year 1711, when she, being pregnant, fearlessly went with Peter to engage in war, specifically against Turkey in the infamous Prut campaign, where Peter's army was completely surrounded by the Turks. Well, it seemed that everything was lost, that now not only the Ottoman Empire will regain all those lands that, let's say, Peter captured during the Azov campaigns, now the king himself will be captured, and it is unclear what will happen next. And at that moment, thanks to the mediation of Chancellor Shafirov, a cunning and skillful diplomat, Catherine goes to negotiate with the vizier, who commanded the army, gives away all her valuables, well, and bribes the vizier. However, it is evident that he succumbed to the charm of Catherine, even though she was pregnant, and as a result the Turkish troops are being set free. The Russian army, along with Peter, compels him to sign a highly disadvantageous agreement, but ultimately they set him free. It was a huge achievement, and probably not by chance. After returning from the Prussian campaign in 1712, Peter marries Catherine. Subsequently, after his coronation as emperor, in the wake of the triumph over the Swedes in 1921, she will receive her coronation as empress. They definitely had an extremely close relationship. Their communication has been preserved, so affectionate and playful. And these were such lengthy, truly close and deeply meaningful love relationships that lasted for an extended period of time, despite the fact that Ekaterina knew about all his other lovers, actresses, singers, she joked about it, wrote to him there in Europe. However, she clearly still had no doubt that he naturally possesses very strong feelings for her. On October 21st, 1715, Alexei's beloved wife Charlotte tragically dies after giving birth to their precious child. Alexei is desperate. He is sobbing. Well, he used to be a heavy drinker in general. Well, at Peter's court, this, however, was accepted. But Alexei, apparently from childhood, started abusing alcohol from a young age. He is crying. He is almost fainting. He is drinking. He is in a terrible condition. And during the funeral of his wife, the father hands him a letter in which he writes very harshly, expressing that the prince does not meet his expectations, behaves incorrectly, is not a support for his father, and must change his behavior, or else he will be deprived of his inheritance and lose his rightful share of the family wealth. 
Why did Peter wait until now, but now, at the most inappropriate moment, he stopped tolerating Alexei? Unfortunately, a very simple explanation. A week after Charlotte's death, Peter's son was born. Ekaterina gave birth to a son, a boy named Peter, Peter Petrovich. Thus, he got another heir. Alexei was no longer required by him. Alexei, to some extent, even perhaps experienced a sense of relief, and he repeatedly spoke during this time about the fact that he actually desired to go to a monastery. And Peter. Sometimes I pondered it and realized that it's not that bad. Meanwhile, he fully understood that one can join a monastery and also leave it later. What will happen after Peter's death? Will Prince Alexei not come back to the world? to worldly life? Will he not seize power? Will he not take action against his wife and children from Ekaterina? Generally, Peter was contemplating these ideas in his mind, but still did not permit the prince to proceed to the monastery. The prince feels that the clouds around him are thickening. In 1716, a year after all these events, he seems to say that he is going to Europe to meet someone who was there at the time, apparently advised by Alexander Kikin, the head of the Admiralty of St. Petersburg, who sympathized with him in general, who obviously hoped that the Tsarevich would be raised to the throne, and, well, maybe he was waiting for some career for himself, maybe he just felt sorry for him. In any case, the prince sets off on a long journey to meet his father. In fact, he doesn't get anywhere. He only arrives at Gdansk, formerly Danzig, then departs, gets lost, and disappears without a trace. Then he declares himself in the lands of the Austrian emperor, who was a relative of his late wife, and asks for asylum. And they hide him there. He didn't come alone. He came with his beloved surf girl, Ephrosinia. They conceal them, they move them around. Peter, upon discovering the prince's disappearance, becomes incredibly enraged. Well, in anger, because someone dared to contradict him, because no one knows where the prince has gone and whether he will now join Peter's enemies and what he is doing now and whether he is planning to seize power. Peter starts searching for him. The prince is hidden, transported from place to place. Peter sends two incredible adventurous people, namely Peter Andreevich Tolstoy and Alexander Ivanovich Rumyantsev, in search of the prince, because Tolstoy is already an elderly person and requires assistance. He believed it was the right time for him to take a break. He had a diplomatic career, political in nature, but they entrusted him with such important matters and responsibilities. Peter comprehends, possesses knowledge of the intellect, shrewdness, cynicism of Tolstoy, and he dispatches them alongside Rumyantsev. They are searching for him all over Europe. They discover that the prince is located somewhere in the lands of his relative. They get in touch with the Austrian emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI. They request the extradition of the son, but he declines. Following that, the prince is genuinely ensnared in such an intricate network of intrigues. He has been searched for a long time and obviously he could not be found for so long because besides, let's say, the Austrian emperor who sympathized with him, he apparently was supported by the Russian ambassador in Vienna, Avram Vasilovsky, who probably, like Kikin, thought that Russia would be better off with Alexei and therefore it was not possible to find him for quite a long time. After long travels, he finds himself in Naples at this moment, and Tolstoy achieved that. The emperor stated that he will not extradite Alexei, but he will permit a conversation with him. That was without a doubt a mistake. Upon their arrival in Naples, they proceed to have a conversation with Alexei. First, they suggest him to return, promise him forgiveness. Alexei doesn't believe, generally doesn't trust his father's words. He is filled with fear, and as a result, he adamantly refuses to return. They show him a letter in which he is promised complete forgiveness for all of his sins, providing him with a glimmer of hope and a chance to start anew. In the event of a return, repentance, and other related situations that may occur as a result.
The prince, in a state of agonizing indecision, ponders what to do, and at that moment he takes a desperate step forward. He corresponds with Sweden, with Sweden with which Russia has been engaged in conflict for an extended period of time, and requests for asylum. And this naturally was an unbelievable stroke of luck for the Swedish people. If this occurred, it would have been a devastating blow to Peter. Regardless of the prince's distance from his father, he still had extensive knowledge. He could have ended up with the Swedes and naturally revealed to them everything he knew. The Swedes could have utilized it against Peter in their war. They could have attempted, they would definitely have attempted to assist him in ascending to the throne in return for a promise of peace. And by this time, it's 1917, the Swedes are already losing the war. So it would have been an incredible gift for them. The prince is receiving a letter back to Naples, in which he is promised to be accepted in Sweden. But this letter is delayed because during the entire correspondence, Pyotr Andreevich Tolstoy convinces, intimidates and persuades the prince. And he finds its weak spot. This is his beloved Ephrosinia whom he apparently either intimidates or bribes, promising her, of course, absolute and unconditional pardon. And she additionally begins to pressure him and state that he needs to return. And they are returning. They are on their way back. Alexei openly repents and expresses remorse in a public ceremony at the Assumption Cathedral located in Moscow. He renounces his right to inheritance. Little Peter Petrovich is to be the heir to the business. And immediately the investigation into the prince's case begins. He was promised forgiveness if he repents, if he tells the whole truth about what he did. Here, of course, during this investigation, the prince behaves inappropriately. He tries to whitewash himself. He blames everyone he possibly can. He calls everyone who supported him, who expressed sympathy to him. He mentions specifically Alexander Kikin, the same person who assisted him greatly, helped him escape, did a lot for him, and obviously aided him in communicating with his mother. And here emerges the story of the correspondence between the prince and his mother, and of him visiting her. And the investigation starts, and it turns out she wears stylish clothes, and she has a romance with Major Glebov, whom evidently she loved deeply, just as well as he does. Additionally, Peter releases an astonishing amount of rage upon them. Naturally, it is scarcely the jealousy of a former husband. This is naturally the fear that Evdokia is scheming something, that perhaps there is a conspiracy at play here. Evdokia is once again being dressed in monastic attire. She is sent to a monastery under strict supervision, where she will remain until the death of her husband. After that, she will outlive his second wife, Ekaterina. Once her grandson, Peter II, ascends the throne, she will be released from the monastery brought to Moscow, and there she will live peacefully and in honor until the year 1731. 1931, but in general, in peace, in honor. She rarely felt such happiness after all that had occurred to her. However, in any case, the conclusion of her life was peaceful, at the very least. Moreover, Kikina and Glebova, they were completely dealt with. They are being tortured. Kikin initially revealed all about Evdokia and about Glebov, and many other things in detail. Then he renounced his testimony, then he was interrogated again, and he confirmed it again. And in the end, he is sentenced to death. He is tortured, that is, to a painful death penalty, although it seems that even Ekaterina, his wife, interceded for Peter, but Peter was completely unbending. And naturally, the dreadful destiny of Stepan Glebov, who was subjected to a number of unbelievable tortures. Peter attempted numerous individuals whom he adored tormenting, and he actively engaged in it personally. He displayed an incredibly cruel nature towards his political adversaries. He still, I think, had such a sense of the experimenter's nature. He loved all sorts of scientific tricks. Here, observe how they attempt an individual. He remained intrigued by such a purely natural scientific perspective. 
Glebova was tried in an incredibly perfect manner. He did not provide any evidence against Evdokia, after which he was placed on a stake on Red Square as a punishment for his actions. It was winter, February, and they put a fur coat on him so that he wouldn't freeze, so that he would suffer longer. And he sat on the stake for 14 HRS alive. This is, of course, a scary and creepy story. The inquiry into the case of the Tsarevich is ongoing and he attempted to conceal certain matters to maintain silence regarding something. Here again it turned out to be his weak link, because the main evidence that ruined him was given to him by Ephrosinia, who told how he dreamed of seizing power, who told how he sent letters to sympathetic people in Russia, what negotiations he conducted, how he negotiated with Sweden. That is, everything he was keeping hidden, she revealed. The prince was not a very pleasant person, but he definitely had strong feelings of love for Frosenia. He wrote her tender letters. When they were taken to Russia, they were taken separately. She was pregnant, and he took care of her, wrote to her how worried he was that she should see a doctor and something else. We do not know who was born to Euphrosina. We do not even know the gender of this child or where he went. It is highly likely to assume that this child, who could potentially pose a threat to the throne, could have been dealt with or could have been sent somewhere. In any case, it is a mystery shrouded in darkness. But then Ephrosinia starts giving testimony. Moreover, she first gives testimony, then gives them a confrontation, and he somehow locks himself up, and she keeps drowning him, drowning and drowning. Peter generally satisfied with Euphrosina. She not interrogated unlike Prince, interrogated terribly. She was justified, she was released. Additionally, her fate is not completely clear. She received a large sum of money from Peter. Some said that he cut her hair and sent her to a monastery. There is an opinion that she received money for betrayal and then got married. However, in any event, the traces of her are lost. No one took any action to punish her. And Prince Peter is entirely and absolutely convinced that there was a conspiracy, that the prince attempted to overthrow him. Although highly doubtful, of course, there was a conspiracy. There were conversations, letters, nothing more than that. But Peter wants to get rid of his son. He is accused of treason, of conspiracy. He insists that each and every senator signs beneath his sentence of death without exception. As we know, only Sheremetyev refused to sign this agreement, claiming his duty is to protect royal blood, not to destroy it. The remaining all signed obediently. What occurred subsequently, we do not quite know. The prince was not publicly executed. He died in prison. There are different versions that he died, unable to withstand torture, that Peter decided to avoid public shame for his family and therefore ordered him to be killed in prison, possibly to the identical Peter Andreevich Tolstoy. We lack knowledge. In any circumstance, the prince meets his demise. However, after that, perhaps it is not advisable to say, but it appears to me it is not a coincidence that such an event occurred. In summer 1718, the Tsarevich was executed. A few days later, Peter was already celebrating Peter and Paul, his own name day, and having a great time. Another six months passed, and his little son, Petr Petrovich, also died. He will have one more son, Pavel, but Pavel won't live long. Notably, he had no other sons during his lifetime. Peter was unable to come to terms yet again with the thought that this unpleasant son of his should inherit from him, which caused him great distress. And therefore, after the death of the prince, after the murder of the prince, he changes the order of the throne inheritance. He releases a decree regarding the throne of inheritance, in accordance with which it is no longer necessary for the heir to be a direct descendant in the male line of succession. Peter established a circle of royal relatives, from which the sovereign had the option to choose an heir to the throne. He certainly wanted to act in the manner of Roman emperors, who frequently did so with great success, choosing truly suitable individuals as an example to follow. However, ultimately he perished, lacking knowledge of the rightful successor to the throne. 
Legend has it that a few hours before his death, he called his daughter, started dictating his will to her, said give away everything, and fell silent and soon died. It was unclear who to pass the throne to, and further, actually, the next few decades will pass in the struggle of different his successors and different parties supporting one or another candidate in the struggle for the throne. However, this law will only be repealed by Pavel I, who considered himself a victim of this incorrect order of succession to the throne, under which his mother Catherine did not allow him to rule for such a long period of time. Thus concluded the narrative of Prince Alexei, and frequently I find myself contemplating, on the one hand, there have been numerous books and extensive research conducted on him. He is naturally, he performs in the novel by Alexei Tolstoy, Peter I. Mereshkovsky has a novel titled Peter and Alexei, which is very romantic, I would say, and also has a mystical element, or rather can be described as mystical. He was attracted, he was authored, the picture was authored by G, as I already mentioned, the film. However, at the same time, this story is still not important or significant in our perception for the Petrovskaya era that we are currently studying. Each year, starting with my students studying the Petrovskaya era, I ask them first to say, right away, without thinking, their associations with Peter. They're almost the same for everyone, but there are variances. Everyone knows he made people shave beards, created a fleet, built St. Petersburg. Everyone is aware of this. Something additional can be included there. I cannot recall a case where someone stated that they know Peter killed his own son. Every time when we finish studying the Petrovskaya era, we have such a discussion. We evaluate Peter, how good a ruler he was, what he said, what can be said in favor of his rule, against. And often my students suggest what can be said in favor of the Petrovsky administration, what can be said against it. Here are some clear arguments for and against. They never call the case of Tsarevich Alexei. And when I myself say, guys, but what, that he killed his son, we will not take that into consideration. And frequently I am informed of something like, well, he did it for the sake of the motherland, for the sake of the interests of the state. Not all, I will not slander my students, not everyone says so, but it is very interesting. It is regrettable that this scary and tragic story in some way ends up being marginalized in our perception of the reformist king and that we are prepared to offer justifications for it, thus diminishing its significance and impact. This never ceases to amaze me. For me, this story is one of the most important for understanding Peter. Naturally, it does not diminish the greatness of his character, the grandeur of the reforms he carried out. All of this is not worth arguing about. However, I cannot think about the Petrovsky reforms without thinking about Tsarevich Alexei, who was tortured on the orders of his father, Tsar Nicholas II, during that time. Maybe I'm mistaken? but it appears highly important to me. This lesson, similar to all prior ones, wouldn't have been recorded without the assistance of patrons who support us on Patreon, for which we are immensely grateful, as usual. And if you enjoyed this lesson and you also want to support us, then a massive thank you to you as well. I want to know, read comments, your thoughts on Tsarevich Alexei and what Peter the Great did to him. What is your opinion on the fate of Alexei under Peter's rule? To what extent were these actions justified? Well, maybe it's incorrect to say if we can forgive this or not. What is there to forgive? A considerable amount of time has passed since then. However, how significant is the case of Tsarevich Alexei for understanding Peter and the Petrovskaya era? I would be delighted to read your comments. Goodbye.